Hey Facebook, this is Mara, and today I'm here with Wade Bond. He is the executive director of the Children's Advocacy Network. Hey Wade. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Of course. Um, so I just want to jump right in and start talking about the Children's Advocacy Network. Sorry, that's a tongue twister. Right. <laughs> um, if you could give me a little bit of background about y'all um, and kind of walk me through either day-to-day -day operations or um, top things pre-COVID-19 so that everyone can get like a where you were before we sure. go to where we are now. Sure. Well, um, our agency is actually about to celebrate its 25th anniversary. So that's incredible. Uh, in June, we will have been around since 1995. And, uh, in, the, in the last 24 plus years, uh, we have uh, created a region-wide response to addressing the needs of children who have been abused and neglected and working uh, in hand with uh, child welfare, DCFS, uh, and law enforcement and the courts to address uh, kids' needs and families' needs as they come uh, and work through the, uh, the, the court system and also their specific individual needs as well. And, uh, we've got three main programs. Our Children's Advocacy Center uh, works primarily with children that have been sexually abused um, and whose cases are going to be going through the criminal court system. And so we've got a great team of um, our staff as well as uh, others who work with us in law enforcement, uh, the medical community, uh, district attorney's offices, uh, and victim advocacy to uh, address the needs of children and families uh, as they heal uh, fr from the abuse. We also have a CASA program uh, that is region-wide too, and, and, and that program advocates for children that have been removed from their homes and placed in the foster care system. And our, our goal there is to recruit uh, volunteers across the entire region uh, to advocate for safe and permanent homes for kids and get them in and out of the system as quickly as possible. Uh, and our newest program, which is a little over 10 years old now, is uh, our trauma therapy program. And we provide uh, very specific uh, therapy services to children who are experiencing trauma symptoms or PTSD uh, as a result of their abuse. And, and, and all three of our services uh, are completely free. Uh, to the families and, and children that we work with. And uh, we've had great support over the years uh, across the region uh, to assist uh, not only children and families, but us and, and our growth uh, to expand and, and truly to become a regionalized uh, agency. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you so much for everything that you and um, the agency does. That's, that's awesome. Well, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. On behalf of everybody, uh, I like to tell everybody that, you know, the staff does 99% of the work. And uh, unfortunately, y'all get to see me in front of the cameras. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Um, so obviously what you just talked about is very hands-on, um, person-to-person, relationships, meetings, all of that. So let's talk now about how um, COVID-19 has affected that and then like what changes and adjustments have been made to be able to continue doing all of what you do. Sure. Well, you know, one of, one of the uh, distinct honors of our agency uh, is that we've been labeled an essential uh, workforce. And um, so uh, we all know that child abuse doesn't stop with the worldwide pandemic, and uh, as such, our agency uh, continues to work on a day-to-day -day basis to advocate for, for kids. Um, specifically, our Children's Advocacy Center uh, is continuing uh, to work with children and families and law enforcement and DCFS in our, in our main office. And uh, we're seeing children uh, regularly from across the region uh, who have experienced abuse continue to come in. Uh, obviously, we're, we're taking some significant precautions and safety measures to ensure their comfort uh, and safety uh, through this unfortunate experience. Um, but we're following uh, CDC guidelines and uh, you know, masks, face shields, gloves when needed. 
to make everybody uh, as comfortable as possible, but as safe as possible, more importantly. And um, that's that's been something that I'm really impressed with with our crew uh, for coming together and creating opportunities uh, or solutions uh, to the unique opportunities that the, the pandemic uh, has put in front of us. Uh, we are built on relationships as an agency and uh, we have a lot of um, meetings and, and one-on-one -on -one interaction. While uh, they have all moved or most of them have moved to uh, Zoom and, and virtual reality, uh, we're still continuing to have those meetings and, and work through uh, the collective needs of, of families and our, and our key supporters as well. Our uh, CASA program, which is, is court driven, uh, has changed a little bit over the last uh, two months. Um, in fact, uh, there's a court order uh, through the Supreme Court of Louisiana that uh, the majority of courts hearings aren't held until after June 30th. Um, we're still working with the court systems in, 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 in each JDC and uh, we're still actually having hearings uh, that are necessary and are within the guidelines. Um, our advocates are uh, getting restless after two months uh, because they, you know, while, while they know they need to make phone calls and, and, and FaceTime uh, kids and everybody wants to get together as quickly as possible. So we've been working the past several weeks of uh, pre-planning how to get back into the community and, and, and get our volunteers uh, the, the resources that they need to be safe. Uh, and also the families that we work with to, to, to be safe when we have these interactions. And so uh, we're, we're very excited um, about the responses that we've gotten. And every time uh, we've needed something from the community to assist, uh, they've just stepped up. It's, it's just been amazing. And our, in our therapy services, um, we're doing both, uh, you know, uh, telehealth as well as in person. Uh, depending on the uh, needs and, and health of, of the families that we're working with. But, um, you know, our concern as an agency is, is that with no school, uh, no uh, large gatherings of children's and, and youth organizations uh, having to shutter their, their doors for after hour services and support, um, the reality is children aren't, do not have the capability to disclose to outsiders uh, as, as much as they used to. And so uh, in some respects, we're seeing uh, uh, less children disclose, uh, but uh, on the flip side, we're actually seeing more children coming into care. So unfortunately, we're, we're dealing with a crisis on top of a crisis and uh, we're doing the best that we can uh, internally and collectively, and we're thankful for the support of our foster parents, the court systems, child welfare, law enforcement, uh, and our community supporters uh, throughout the process to kind of help us recreate uh, or create a new wheel or response to COVID. Yeah, that's a lot. And there's a lot of different adjustments and changes that had to happen to be able to get to that place. Um, so that's um, good on y'all. Thank you for doing that to be able to keep this um, an essential. It is an essential business, but to keep it to be that um, help to those who need it is incredible. Yeah, that's great. Well, the, the team pulled together, and I've got to tell you, we, you know, for the last two years, we've been really focusing on uh, becoming a more resilient team and a more resilient agency. And in addition to that, um, how do we uh, address uh, the continuing changing and altering uh, society and, and, and communities that we live in? And, you know, while we weren't expecting uh, this test, uh, I'm very impressed with the response of the team uh, and our community to support uh, our needs throughout this time. Yeah, that's great. One thing that you mentioned was the community has been there to help whenever you needed it. Um, so I want to bring up one of your biggest fundraisers that y'all have done in the past, and that's um, the Holly Fest. So yeah. we're able to have that this year. Uh, walk me through, like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> How has that changed fundraising for y'all? 
Well, you know, we were, the timing of COVID um, was perfect in the sense that uh, we had raised uh, enough money to purchase the, the colors. And so in terms of our pre-planning, we're, we're not out of any expenses. Um, the unfortunate reality is that I've got 10 boxes of colors uh, at a secure location, so don't go find them, um, that uh, are ready to be thrown in the air. And so we're trying to figure out what's the best uh, response uh, that we can provide that's safe uh, and secure for everybody. You know, the the Holy Fest has has brought people uh, of all ages together in downtown Alexandria for years. And, you know, the reality is when you look at the beautiful pictures that, that have been taken over the past several years of, of everybody getting as close to one another as possible and, and throwing colors in the air, uh, while the fire truck is, is squirting uh, water on everybody. Um, unfortunately, that's not going to happen anytime soon. And so we've got to, we've got to come up with the, an alternative solution for that. You know, as an agency, uh, we did take a hit uh, in terms of the, the fundraising dollars associated uh, with the loss of that fundraiser and another fundraiser. Um, but uh, right now, we've got a very strong board um, that has given us the opportunity to focus on service delivery um, and, and primarily focus on, on, on addressing the needs of the kids and families and, and, and staff safety. And so while we know this is going to be difficult uh, financially uh, over the next couple months, if not the next, you know, two years, uh, I, I feel good that we're in a position where we can continue the services that we have. Now we're, you know, obviously having to make some changes financially, um, but uh, we're not laying anybody off. In fact, we're, we're continuing some of our expansion uh, of service delivery. So uh, we want to get back to, to fundraising uh, and, and, you know, services uh, are, get out there as a result of uh, fundraising dollars uh, raised. And, you know, the next next couple of months, we're just kind of in a holding pattern uh, until we can what, until we can see what we can do. But at this time, our primary focus has has been uh, service delivery and, and, and safety of, of, of families and, and staff. Yeah. So even though the fundraising may be put on a hold, um, your work is not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post in the comments. Uh, below, I'm going to post your website so that if people do awesome. want to give to y'all, they have that ability as well. That'd be great. Thank you so much. You know, uh, everybody with everything going on uh, has their priorities and, and we want to make sure that everybody's priorities are met uh, in their personal lives and, and for their families. But in the event that uh, you do have a little extra uh, resources available, whether it's, you know, financial monies or, or some other uh, skill set uh, that you want to contribute. We, we'd love to, to have that support. Yeah, excellent. Um, so I kind of want to get a different perspective. This is probably one of the hardest questions. Um, and that is what is the biggest positive thing that you've seen out of this? This is forcing us to think about um, everything wrong that's happening and get a different view of it. So if there was one thing that you could say was the biggest positive thing to come out of COVID-19 basically shutting down the country, what would it be? <laughs> well, you know, I think for, for I'll, I'll speak for me personally. Um, it's, it's slowing down and recognizing uh, where my priorities need to be. Uh, you know, uh, family first has always been a model of our agency and literally now, uh, every day with schools and daycare shut down, it is family first for all of us. Um, so there, the, the the silver lining in this epidemic is uh, we're 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 becoming more connected with one another uh, in our personal lives, and, and the work life balance uh, hopefully is is becoming more equal, equalized um, from an agency perspective. Um, you know, seeing how resilient our staff has been 
in addressing their own personal needs and the needs of families and specifically children that come into our care uh, has just been rewarding. Um, you know, our strengths uh, as an agency far outweigh the inconveniences of, of COVID. And we're seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis in everything that we do. And quite frankly, you know, when you've got over 200 volunteers who want to get out there and they want to advocate for their kids and they can't, and they're having to come up with creative ways uh, to engage and keep engaged and keep, you know, gathering the information that connections. I'm just, I'm, I'm floored by the ingenuity of everybody. Um, yes, this has been a setback, um, but from day one, we've looked at this as a marathon, not a sprint. And, uh, you know, whatever the new normal is, or what, you know, some people say whatever the new abnormal is, uh, I, I've just, I've just been completely impressed by our collective uh, resilience and ability to, to recognize their problem and address it and move on. Yeah, that's really good. Um, we are excited to see how the fundraising changes or what's going to happen with that. Um, I know that's a huge part of our community as well. Um, but thank you so much for, through all the ups and downs of all of this, um, for you and your agency being there for these kids and um, helping them out where they need it. Thank you for that. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me on today. Of course. And have a great rest of your day. Same to you.